mind, I am pleased that Professor Peter Savastano, who teaches in both the departments of anthropology and religion and who serves on the core advisory board and the signature course curriculum committee, is our second presenter. Professor Savastano's book, Merton and Indigenous Religions, is an anthology of essays about Thomas Merton, an author included in our core one modern text, and the Trappist monk whom Pope Francis called one of four notable Americans mentioned in his talk to the United States Congress in 2015. The quality for which the Holy Father praised Merton was dialogue, the ability to remain strong in one's faith, in Merton's case, Catholicism, while openly and respectfully encountering the faith of others. And it is this quality with regard to indigenous religions that Professor Savastano's book explores. Dr. Todd Stockdale, coordinator of Core One and a Core Fellow, will handle the Q&A, and Dr. Casey Choi, coordinator of Core Two and chair of the Department of Religion, will give the introduction. Dr. Troy. I will always um, get that incorrect, the mute thing. Um, and I will take that as my cue, um, Nancy. OK, great. Thank you. And um, I, it is my pleasure to introduce Peter Savastano, uh, who is a who is an associate professor um, who holds a joint appointment between the Department of Anthropology, Sociology and Social Work and the Department of Religion. He holds a BA in Religious Studies and Philosophy from Montclair State University and an MPhil and PhD in Religion and Society from Drew University. And he has a long storied history with the Catholic Worker Movement. Dr. Savastano's areas of expertise are vast and would take us well to list them all here. They really would. I, you know, I tried my best to, uh, to uh, be as, as succinct as possible. So I'll only highlight a few of his academic research areas uh, for now. Um, they include the anthropology of religion with a focus on Anglican, Catholic, and Orthodox mysticism, vernacular devotional practices, the intersections between religion and issues of sexuality and gender, the anthropology of consciousness and world indigenous sacred ritual and healing traditions, most especially American Indian traditions and African diasporic traditions. In addition to these areas of study, Dr. Savistano is also an expert in the lives and works of Roman Catholic mystics, B. Griffiths, Henry Lasso, and of course, Thomas Merton. He has been studying Thomas Merton since his early adolescence and has published numerous articles on Merton, including one titled Thomas Merton Saved My Life and Taught Me What It Means to Be Truly Catholic. His recent edited book, Merton and Indigenous Wisdom, which is the focus of our book forum today, as Nancy Enright just mentioned, was recently praised by the Catholic theologian Christopher Premick of Regis University as a, quote, penetrating study of Merton's efforts to confront the sin of ethnocentrism. Prema concludes that Dr. Savistano's edited book, quote, could not have come at a more fortuitous time, end quote. And you can read this outstanding review of Dr. Savistano's book in the current edition of the Journal of American Catholic Studies, which by the way, is edited by one of our colleagues in the history department. Uh, he's on sabbatical, so I won't invoke his name right now, just in case he may hear it and, uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, at any rate, um, please join me in welcoming my colleague and friend, um, Peter Savistano. Well, thank you, and I'm so happy to be here. Um, yes, that uh, review actually just appeared today, and it's the first uh, review of the book, and I couldn't be more thrilled. I absolutely love uh, Christopher Pramick's work. He wrote a book on Merton and Merton's relationship to Holy Sophia about six or seven years ago, which I devoured um, and I highly recommend it. Uh, I can only say I hope reincarnation is a reality because with all of my areas of interest, one lifetime is obviously not enough to really develop my scholarly understanding and personal understanding of all of these people and all of these areas that have pretty much obsessed me um, for mo most of my life. Um, certainly my adult life, if uh, not before that. Um, I want to start, if I might, um, with a quote. Uh, and this is a quote from actually someone who 
I was pretty sure I was not a fan of. Uh, I began getting uh, these daily meditations from uh, Franciscan priest Richard Rohr, and um, I have actually come to um, really uh, appreciate a lot of what he says. So this is a quote from one of those meditations. It appeared on September 22nd, and when it did, Knowing this event was coming up, it just struck me as really encapsulating a lot of what my doing this volume is about. And I really want to talk uh, today about the larger context of why this volume and particularly its inclusion in what's known as the Merton Ann series. Um, so uh, here's the quote. The late brother Wayne Teasdale coined the term interspiritual to describe the shared mystic heart beating in the center of the world's spiritual traditions. This perspective encompasses a much broader scope of shared religious experience than does its predecessor interfaith movement which focuses more on the dialogue between the established institutionalized religions than on, the, on an intermingling of their common heart. Genuine interspiritual dialogue demands that we draw deeply on our inner knowing and show up for the hard work of understanding. It requires that we not only study and discuss religions other than our own, but that we commit to a disciplined practice in more than one tradition, immersing ourselves in the well of wisdom they offer, allowing these encounters to change us from within. And I could say that if there's uh, one overarching motivating factor for what has obsessed me uh, for almost my entire life since I was 12 years old with Thomas Merton, even though at the time I did not have this kind of language to describe it, it is exactly what Richard Rohr says uh, in this quote. And um, I was thinking along those lines, particularly about Seton Hall, and there's sort of this whole cluster of what I think of as Catholic thinkers who in one way or the other uh, are either the precursors or really the founding visionaries of what we think of as interspirituality. And I want to go down the list of some of them, uh, although not all of them are connected to Seton Hall, some of them are in very significant ways. So I want to start with the first and the most obvious who actually is connected to Seton Hall, whether some of you know this or not, and that is Thomas Merton himself. Uh, Thomas Merton um, did the most beautiful translation of the Shuangsa, otherwise known as the Book of Chuangzu, a Taoist classic. And he did it under the tutelage of John Wu, a professor in Asian studies and also in the law school here at Seton Hall. Um, so there's one very important connection. Um, Another of these Catholic thinkers and one who has had a profound influence on me is Teilhard de Chardin. The other, as Casey mentioned, is Dombey Griffiths. Uh, and Wayne Teasdale, by the way, was his primary student and um, Dombey Griffiths was really the mentor and spiritual guide of um, Wayne Teasdale. The other one is uh, a fellow by the name of Swabi, Swami Abhishek Dananda. His actual name is Henri Lasso. He was a Benedictine monk from France who actually went and lived in India, became the student of a famous Hindu teacher, um, had profound mystical experiences that transformed him. While he remained a Benedictine monk till the end of his days, he took on the name Swami Abhishek Dananda because he had been so changed as a person by uh, his experiences in the Hindu tradition. The other is 
Eaton Hall, but also there for a number of years in the religion department, Ilya DeLeo. Um, and then uh, Paul Knitter, the Catholic theologian who was simultaneously a Tibetan Buddhist, was a professor at a Union Theological Seminary and someone who I came to know for a number of years. And then there is the contemporary writer Beverly Lanzetta uh, from an Italian Catholic background, writes a lot about the new monasticism, has developed an entirely non-anthropomorphic language of the sacred and of God that really speaks to a lot of young people, especially those who identify as spiritual but not religious, or as having what are known as MRAs or multiple religious allegiances, a very common phenomenon in a rapidly globalizing world connected by technology. Um, the other is the Irish um, Christian brother, Diarmuid Omer Shu, who has written a lot about the future of religion, particularly in the 20th century. And then, um, also, once a faculty member at Seton Hall, one of my all-time favorites, Thomas Berry. Um, and then uh, lastly, Ramon Panikar, no connection to Seton Hall, but certainly one of the forefathers. And I tell you this um, only because uh, one of the things that I find so fascinating is how do all of these um, very cutting edge religious thinkers, and this is a question I have asked myself about my own Catholic upbringing and formation. What is it about Catholicism that makes it possible for people to be transformed in this way? I half jokingly say sometimes to others that there is nothing like a Catholic education. They educate you to think so well that you could think yourself right out of being Catholic. Um, so just one of the paradoxes and uh, mysteries of all this. Um, this book, this project, this whole series really comes to me out of my great interest in consciousness related issues. Um, and particularly, um, what is it about the world? What is it about one's experience that changes a person in the way that Merton, over the course of his career, was so radically changed from having the zeal of a convert to someone, as I say uh, in the introduction of the book, um, conservative Catholics consider dangerous and advise people, uh, young people particularly, not to read the late Merton, but instead read the early Merton. I refer to these as Merton 1.0 and Merton 2.0. Um, the course that I teach on Merton here at Seton Hall, I could tell you if we were taking a poll, and I've been teaching the course here now, I would say it's about 10 years maybe a little longer. Yeah, I think it's a little longer. It's about 11 years, and the majority of them prefer Merton 2.0, not Merton 1.0. Um, so uh, a totally unscientific anecdotal study, but um, nevertheless. And I think one of the things that uh, uh, has always both fascinated and puzzled me, you know, and I, I pose these things in terms of questions. How is it that this guy living in a cloistered Trappist monastery, living the last uh, years of his religious life in a hermitage, how is it, and at a particular time in history, most of it pre-Vatican II, the last few years post-Vatican II, how is it that this guy was living in this monastery thought of to be one of the strictest Catholic contemplative orders, at least at the time. And he is studying all of these other religious traditions and not just studying them for the purpose of dialogue, but studying them for the purpose of being transformed. 
And he operated in so many ways like an anthropologist operates. He was not satisfied with just going into archives and reading about a particular tradition. He then sought in the way an anthropologist goes out into the field, he sought practitioners of those traditions. He sought to engage with them. He sought to learn from them. I find it hard to believe that anyone who has read, for example, Merton's beautiful essays, Mystics and Zen Masters, can conclude that this man was not taking what he had studied and had learned from others and wasn't trying to practice it himself. Uh, we know that at the end of his life, uh, in that at that conference that he attended and in Thailand where he died, Prior to that, he had the opportunity to visit with the Dalai Lama and to meet some of the greatest Dzogchen Tibetan Buddhist masters alive at the time. And Merton uh, was really seriously trying to determine which of those he would ask to be his Buddhist teacher and Lama. Uh, uh, that in and of itself just continues to totally um, fascinate me. And also, um, the other thing that I often wonder about and continue to ask questions and try to make sense of is, how is it that Merton could be so prescient in many ways about the world in which we find ourselves living now? Um, he could see coming in many ways the, as a result, I think, of technological advancement. And certainly he had no way of anticipating the degree of globalization that we are experiencing and would work. But he sensed that there was a huge shift coming and that the way that we human beings thought about religion was not going to work anymore. And one of the things that he said in the speech that he gave about an hour and a half before he tragically died in Thailand, speech at the end of his Asian journal, not volume seven of his actual journals, which were released uncensored after 25 years after his death, but the commercial volume that was published shortly after. And in there, what he said about religion and particularly institutional organized religion has stayed with me to this day. He said, all structures are collapsing. Each of us must learn to stand on his own two feet and make his way to God. That, I think, um, this whole interspiritual movement is sort of a response to that. Um, one of the ways that I have tried to make sense out of this, and I use this model in all of the religion courses that I teach whenever have a, I have a chance to give a talk on religion in the world in which we are living, the idea that one religion is true and all the other ones are either dim reflections of that truth or contain kernels of truth but are nevertheless not up to snuff is just not going to work. It is not working for our young people. It is not working for many people. And for whatever reason, they get to a state of consciousness that uh, the uh, English and Ghanaian scholar Anthony Appia has described as cosmopolitanism that human beings, some human beings get to a state of consciousness where they realize they are citizens of the world. They are citizens of the cosmos and all of the world's sacred traditions are our heritage and we can learn and be enriched by all of them. My way of making sense out of this is to say, Religions are like languages. English is not more true than Spanish. Spanish is not more true than French. Now, I happen to speak three languages, and I can tell you I could say things in Haitian Creole and Spanish 
that I could never say in English. There's just no words to do it. And there are also words in English that Spanish just cannot do justice to. And there are words in Haitian Creole that um, cannot be found. English says things better. And so, you know, my thinking about this is, I um, mean, I think this quote from Richard Rohr sort of suggests that as well, um, that uh, in a rapidly globalizing world, whether we are talking about actual languages or talking about religions, we human beings need to become uh, proficient uh, and fluent in more than one religious language. Um, I, I often say the way I think about it is I have my native tongue and my native language is Christianity, but I also speak a really mean Buddhist and I speak the dialogue, the dialects of Zen and, to, and Tibetan or Vajrayana Buddhist. I speak a fairly fluent Sufism or Islamic mysticism, whatever the tradition may be. And each of these traditions has a language, has concepts, doctrines, rituals, practices. Um, and uh, that equates well with the anthropological model of what um, uh, language is. <clears throat> so these are some of the things that really continue to um, fascinate me. And in terms of Merton, uh, I have no way of proving this, but just from you know, reading, and I've read pretty much everything the man has written, um, and it uh, really does seem to me that he is a prime example of what Teilhard de Chardin described as the planet evolved and as human beings evolved, uh, the gifts of it, the challenges of that kind of evolution that Teilhard wrote about was something called complexification that um, we would find ourselves, the more the world evolved towards the omega point that Teilhard de Chardin saw as the presence of Christ pulling us towards the future, rather than things simplifying, they would become so much more complex and we would have to entertain and deal with and integrate so much more than we ever have before. I think Merton was an early version of that. And the other concept is planetization. I think Merton's consciousness had evolved to the point that he had a, that very global awareness that Appiah describes as cosmopolitanism. Um, so uh, these are really the kinds of things that um, led me to do this volume. Uh, you should know there are seven other um, volumes in it. There is one more to be done and then the series will end. I am not naming them in the order that they were published, but uh, here they are. Uh, the first volume, this I do know, was Merton and Sufism, so his exploration of Islamic mysticism. And by the way, he gave a number of talks when he was the novice master at Gethsemane on Sufism to his novices, as he did on Buddhism, because he thought it was important. There was something there for them to learn as monastics in the making that would help them deal with their own contemplative life and the challenges of the monastic life um, at the time. The other one is Merton and Buddhism, Merton and Judaism, Merton and Hesychasm, so the Hesychastic practices of the Eastern Orthodox traditions, the Jesus prayer being the most famous example of it, but certainly not the only one. Merton and Taoism, which is really, by the way, a volume about Merton and John Wu and Seton Hall, if it's nothing else. To look at that volume and to see the letterhead, the Seton Hall letterhead that John Wu wrote to Thomas Merton on back in the 1960s, and to see his address, he lived in a house on Cottage Place, is just, 
it makes the hair on my arm and the back of my neck stand up on end uh, just to see that. Uh, then Merton and uh, Protestantism uh, and uh, then Merton and indigenous religions. And the next one to come out, the last one will be Merton and Hinduism. And that will end the um, the series as far as uh, we know. I mean, that's a lot of ground to cover and a lot of scholars have devoted their time to it. Now, um, what is it though about indigenous religious traditions um, that really fascinated Merton? And, um, you know, Merton really felt that um, he writes about this, particularly in um, the uh, introduction to uh, the Spanish version of his complete works. Uh, and in this volume, uh, at the end of the volume, is a newly translated version of that. And he writes there about Catholicism. And he goes from Catholicism with a, Catholic, with a capital C to Catholicism with a small c. And he says that Catholicism at its, its best and most universal is rooted in the fundamental realities of the earth and human life that the indigenous traditions, and for Merton, the ind indigenous traditions were not only North American indigenous traditions, they were also Central and South American traditions. And Merton was, I would say, much more deeply drawn to the South American traditions, the Central American traditions. He corresponded with uh, quite a number of uh, Spanish speaking South American and Central American um, scholars and artists and religious thinkers. He familiarized himself with the Aztecs, with the Inca, with the Maya. Uh, and uh, he was also deeply interested in the healing practices of uh, many of the North American indigenous traditions um, uh, as well. And particularly, things like the vision quest. How is it that one, and there's something so deeply monastic about this, you isolate yourself, you spend your time fasting and praying for a vision until suddenly the veil is lifted and you are given guidance about what to do in the next stage of your life. Um, and, um, so this volume is really a number of scholars who have devoted their lives to Merton, um, exploring all of those different dimensions uh, in a number of different ways. Um, I sort of, in the introduction, have described this as uh, Merton was in the process of decolonizing his mind. I borrowed that concept from the famous Algerian African scholar, Frantz Fanon, who wrote so much about race and how um, every person of color um, really has to engage in the act of decolonizing their own mind. But I want to make a larger argument, and I don't necessarily mean this in a pejorative or a negative way, but each and every one of us have been colonized by our own religious upbringing and the doctrines and the dogmas and the practices and the theologies of our own tradition. And as a result of that, I know in my own case, up until I encountered Merton, I lived in a completely Catholic bubble. And it wasn't a Catholic bubble um, that uh, had any holes in it in any way whatsoever. And it's not because I came from a particularly pious or devoted Catholic family, although my family was the kind of Catholic family that uh, practiced a sort of Italian American kind of domestic Catholicism and rarely if ever went to church. I, on the, on the other hand, was exceedingly religious and it greatly troubled my family 
but I lived in an Italian American enclave, enclave in Newark, New Jersey. So I believed the whole world was Italian and Catholic. I even believed that Jesus, Mary, and Joseph were Catholic. Their last name was Christ, and they went to Mass at St. Lucy's Church in Newark, where my family uh, went to mass. And I also believe that even the persons of color who lived in my neighborhood, few that they were, were also Italian and Catholic, because what else could there possibly be? And it wasn't until I got to the huge all boys Catholic high school that I attended in Newark, New Jersey in the 1960s. I was in high school from 1966 to 1970 that the bubble began to break, thanks to the Christian Brothers of Ireland. My religion classes consisted in Catholic high school of listening to the Beatles, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Heart Club Band, and the Jefferson Airplane, and trying to figure out what was spiritual, religious, and theological about those lyrics. And it was in that high school that one of those brothers said to me, you don't belong here. You should go and be with the Quakers. They're your people. And I actually went, and as some of you know, I worked for the American Friends Service Committee for the Quakers for many, many, many years. And bizarrely enough, when I lived at the Catholic Worker, there were at the time four Quakers living there, which was just totally fascinating um, to me. So I think Merton was kind of in the process, especially when it comes to these Native American traditions of not only decolonizing his own mind, but coming to terms with colonialism and imperialism and sadly enough, the role that Christianity and Catholicism in particular played in that imperialism and that colonialism. And it's amazing to me as I kind of um, look at and receive blurbs about book, the number of books now that are now being published about the role that Christianity played in, to the negative, in race and in slavery here in the United States. Um, and I think I should stop there because I know, Nancy, you said 25 minutes. I may have gone a little over, and I want to leave time for discussion, questions, whatever the case may be. Thank you, Thank Caleb. You, Caleb. Uh, Todd, Todd, I can't Turn it over to me. Sure. Uh, I'm hearing a little bit of feedback. I don't know if that's my mic or if others are hearing this. I'm not getting any feedback from okay, you, Todd. Just my so. mic. Okay, great. Um, well, hey, listen, Peter, thank you so much for that. That was excellent. Um, that was fa fantastic. And here together, we have uh, your friends, your colleagues, your fans, Peter, and uh, we want to actually have a chance just to let others ask you questions and kind of get uh, your response to those. And so what I thought we'd do is we would invite questions either just by raising your hand here and I can see those in, in our in our chat, or if you actually want to actually put a question into the chat for Peter, uh, I will read that to him and give him a chance to respond to these to these questions. I'm in trouble. Dr. Stark is here. <laughs> oh, that's good. Dr. Stark, yes, it is yes. so good to see you. It's hey. so good to see you. Can you hear me? We yes. can. Yes. Okay, very good. Peter, thank you so much. This was a trip down memory lane for me, <laughs> having been introduced to Merton very early in my intellectual life. And I think I, in some ways, followed his journey all the way from his wonderful autobiographical accounts at Story Mountain right up to Asian Journal. And if I go up to my library on the third floor of this house, I'm sure I will find at least 10 volumes of Merton's work. And one of the most significant, for, well, two really were really significant for me and that was Mystics 
and Zen Masters, and also Asian Journal. Those two just opened up the world to me in ways that I never could have imagined as an undergraduate in a tiny Catholic university in Nova Scotia, which is where I began doing that reading. And my experience as a Roman Catholic, Peter, is very different from yours, even though I grew up in the old industrial city of Bayonne, in which to this day, when I have students from Bayonne, I will ask them what I call the Bayonne question. And the Bayonne question is, what parish are you from? And without any self-consciousness whatsoever <laughs> on their part, they still identify with a particular parish. But that being said, since my parents both were college educated and my father's religion was the country club, my mother's religion certainly was Roman Catholic, but one of the first things my mother introduced me and my two sisters to when we wanted to go into New York City on a Friday night, she would say to us, girls, you can go as long as you go to the Catholic worker first and go to their, to go to their meetings of clarification, <laughs> which of course we did. And then we found the closest bar that we could find <laughs> and then spent the rest of the evening there. But just to say that the kind of Roman Catholicism I had as a child was very open. So the reading Merton expanded it tremendously for me to what I consider now for me a pretty serious Buddhist practice. So I thank you, Peter, for bringing all this back for me and also for reminding me how powerful intellectually and spiritually and emotionally Thomas Merton was in my life. That was probably too long a statement, but, but thank you, Peter. I don't really have a question. Well, maybe I do have a question that if students were interested to start reading Merton, what essays or book would you recommend to them? Okay, I'll stop now. Yeah, well, um, so uh, I actually, since I teach a course on Merton, um, I, I like to recommend something called the Intimate Merton, which are ec the best excerpts from his seven volumes of journals. Okay. I always recommend Mystics and Zen Masters uh, okay. for exactly the same reason. I have to say that one is probably one of my most favorite books uh, because um, he really takes the reader through so many traditions, including the best of the Christian tradition. And there is an essay in there that is so stunningly beautiful on one of my favorite mystics, Julian of Norwich, yes. who yes. was also his. But you know, he, listening to you, Judith, the other thing that occurred to me, and I only realized this from my students at Seton Hall, in many ways, Merton, uh, I like to think of Merton also as kind of a model for how to do this. And um, there is uh, one Seton Hall alumni who has an essay in this book. Bill, I don't know, maybe some of you will um, remember Bill Torres. Um, he yes. was an anthro major. He was in yes. the honors program. And he has an essay in this book. Um, through taking my Merton course, he became a Daggy scholar along with Michael Carhart, who is also uh, an alum, now a doctoral student at Seton Hall and also works for the university. Um, and uh, it was in the Merton class that Bill raised his hand and said, you know, Dr. Savistano, I've known you for all these years and your life sounds incredibly like Merton, with the exception of your being a totally failed Trappist monk who lasted one week in a monastery. Um, you have done pretty much all the things that he done and it was in that that he has done and it was in that moment that I realized even if it was unconscious, he really provides a prototype for this kind of um, work, interspiritual work, which is more than just dialogue. 
Todd, I see hands up, but I'm not yes. going to take your role away from me. Thank you so much, Peter. I would be deeply, deeply upset if you did. This is the reason I'm here is to do this. No, I'm here to hear you uh, tonight. Peter. But uh, Nancy, if, if uh, you were next and we have some uh, questions in the chat as well. So go ahead, Nancy. OK, Peter, thank you so much again uh, for doing this. Uh, I, I know you, maybe this is a hard question or a weird question, but you've mentioned Dorothy Day. Judith mentioned the Catholic worker and I just I had an odd experience last uh, fall where I went to Gethsemane. It, I was there for a conference for something else and I ended up going to Gethsemane and then right in the same around the same time, I think it was almost maybe, I don't know, within a month or so, I think I met a person who's involved with Dorothy Day's cause and I ended up getting involved with looking at the letters of Martin and Dorothy Day and these things just sort of came together for me. Uh, I know they were they had some con connection, obviously, and I was wondering if you could just speak to that. A little bit, you know, since you lived at the worker and you knew, you know, knew Day and you love Merton so much. And, you know, how do they connect for you? Yeah. Well, um, uh, because of Peter Morin's influence and his mastery of Marx on Dorothy Day and Merton, uh, as a young man, read Marx profusely. So he he had a whole critique of just our materialistic consumerist culture uh, in the same way that Dorothy Day did. And, I, I, you know, I like to think of both of them in some way or another as having experienced the ennui that can go along with living in a culture where everything is a commodity, where every being is uh, an object, uh, where anyone can be bought and sold, uh, where there's a market and an industry for everything. And, and I think they both connected because of their ability. And this is a, a, a quality that has, has often been associated with people who, for whatever reason, are relegated to the margins of an institution or a society. They can often see the chinks in the edifice the cracks in the edifice in a way that those who never have to question the institution and its teachings uh, do not see. They don't have to see it because it works for them. The system is working for them, so they have no reason to question it. And Merton and Dorothy Day were both people who I think could be characterized as on the outside looking in. And even when Dorothy Day converted to Catholicism, she was still in many ways on the outside looking in. She was certainly not in her time a mainstream Catholic in the way that we might think of them today. So they had a common understanding of society and of the importance of the sacred dimensions of life and how to cultivate and maintain a connection with that sacred transforming dimension. Thank you, Peter, and thank you, Dr. Enright. Um, we'll pop uh, into a question here from the chat. Uh, Peter. So this is coming from uh, Dr. Uh, Murzaku in the chat. Uh, she says this. Hi, Peter. This is great. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Peter. This is great. If you could elaborate on the no holes in your upbringing and you being the only Catholic in your household, you were kind of the domestic church. Do the no holes and domesticity of your faith make you a uh, Mertonian? Uh, hmm. <laughs> uh, well, I'd like to just back up a moment um, and say uh, my family was in many ways quite Catholic, um, uh, although it is traditional among Southern Italians to be anti-clerical and highly suspicious of church hierarchy. So that was certainly a dimension of it. But, um, you know, I always tell students and they laugh at this, but my mother had an altar in our home that she prayed before regularly. But my mother was really a Southern Italian because she knew that when she prayed to the Virgin Mary and the Virgin Mary did not answer her, my mother knew what to do. You take the statue of the Virgin Mary, you lock it in a closet and you tell her she stays there until she answers the prayer. Right? So my house 
was filled with Catholic images, Catholic piety, um, and it was on the few times that I went to church. Uh, I should say my upbringing is a little more complex than that. I actually had a, a Jewish grandparent and an Eastern Orthodox grandparent, and both of those also played a role in my up, upbringing. But the few times that I did go to church, I was entranced and mesmerized. You have to remember this was in the 1950s, so long before Vatican II. Um, everything was in another language, Latin, um, and it was a Fellini movie in a lot of ways, in the best sense of the word, not the worst sense of the word. And that just uh, really transformed me. And, um, and despite the fact that I am no longer officially a Roman Catholic, I am culturally, my Catholic upbringing, my Catholic education, those things are never going to go away. That is part of my natural language of Christianity, my native tongue of Christianity. Um, and it's really Merton that um, is perhaps the hole in the bubble. It was Merton, as I say in that essay that I did in the collection that honored his the 100th anniversary of his birth uh, in 2015, um, and it was really Merton who showed me that there was a much broader, broader way, as all of these other Catholics that I have listed here and mentioned earlier have shown me the, the breadth and scope and depth of the Catholic tradition um, as all of these thinkers in one way or another exemplify it. So, and that's just very much a, a, a part of who I am. And um, it's probably never going to go away and I don't want it to go away. I don't know if that helps Inez, but that's the best I can offer. Thank you, Peter, thank you. Uh, Dr. Choi, you have a question. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Stockdale. So, Dr. Savistano, we're being very formal here. Um, <laughs> <I know. laughs> um, one thing that I appreciate about um, about Merton is the kind of cultishness that seems to um, inspire or at least um, uh, motivate. So, um, I'm, I'm appreciating that about this um, um, session. But um, I, I wanted to ask a question that I think is also related to a question that Dr. Floyd uh, posted on, in the chat. And it's a, um, a question about um, interspirituality. Uh -huh. And um, wondering if you can sp um, speak a little bit more about interspirituality, especially how uh, Merton understood it, or perhaps how Merton uh, may um, help us to um, uh, approach it, to embrace it, maybe practice it. And um, I'm also curious um, if you um, could, if you're able to say something about how. Um, interspirituality can also be a kind of um, practice of solidarity, um, or at least the possibility of interspirituality being a practice of solidarity. And I, I only ask that because um, I, I'm kind of struck by the fact that there are all these volumes on Merton and other religions, um, but specifically your volume, Merton and Indigenous um, um, uh, um, Religious Traditions, um, the the fraught relationship um, that uh, Christianity has had with indigenous communities um, and um, the possibility of interspirituality uh, between Christians and um, Native American traditions or um, uh, broader indigenous traditions, um, how that might be uh, a po possibly a form of, of reconciliation, a form of, of, of solidarity um, as well. I, I'm, I'm sort of um, searching for the right way of asking the question right now, but um, um, so in essence, if you can say a little bit more about interspirituality in Merton and, and secondly, um, if interspirituality can be a form of, of solidarity slash uh, reconciliation. 
Yeah, okay, so um, <clears throat> I'll try. <laughs> you know, this is something that I'm always in the process of trying to figure out myself. Um, so uh, a good example is Merton's, I would say probably of all the religious traditions that Merton exposed himself to in the many ways that he did, the one that had the most impact on him was Zen Buddhism. And um, particularly the concept of sunyata or emptiness, the idea that although all of creation and even our subjective experience feels like we have a self and like things have essences, the Buddhist teaching on emptiness is they only appear that way. In fact, they do not have essences. And Merton, in reading the Zen masters, really uh, through his, he describes, in fact, to um, a Sufi that he corresponded with uh, the way that he prays every day. And it, it's essentially, even though he didn't use the language of Zen, he is describing what it is like to sit in Zen meditation and to sit in, den, in Zen meditation is to allow every concept that you have to fall away so that you can have a direct unmediated experience of the divine. And quite interestingly, towards the end of his life, one of the last books that Merton read before he died was called A Final Integration of the Adult Personality. It was written by an Iranian American psychotherapist by the name of A. Reza Aresta. Uh, it's long out of print, but a fabulous book. And in that book, Aresta goes through a number of historically significant thinkers, Goethe, Rumi, uh, I don't remember the other, and then three or four just ordinary human beings. And he talks about um, what it means to be a finally integrated human being. And his argument, which impressed Merton so much, is that um, the finally integrated adult human being is one who has been able to liberate himself from the conditionings of his own culture, which includes his religious tradition, and out of that liberation can return to it, but returns to it in freedom. And it also um, uh, includes in that, and, and this was uh, articulated uh, by a fellow by the name of James Fowler, who was a fairly well-known psycho uh, psychology and religion person. He wrote a book called Stages of Religious Maturity. And uh, in that book, he outlines the stages of religious maturity. And you are a finally religiously mature person when you are to the point that you can actually understand your religious traditions and make choices about what you are going to accept or you are not going to accept. And I think Mer this was Merton's head. Um, in terms of this volume and interspirituality and Native American traditions, I say in the introduction there, and you know, I'm now putting on my anthropologist head rather than my religious studies scholar theologian head hat. Um, I say there, uh, because of uh, Christianity's history with Native Americans, um, because of America's history with Native Americans, which is not a pretty picture, as an anthropologist, I have never been able to find um, it in my conscience to actually go and do field work among Native Americans. I, I just think that would be a mistake, especially given the also racist and very colonialist imperialist history of anthropology as a discipline. It's not a pretty picture either. And rather, I would have to satisfy myself with um, what Barbara Brown Taylor calls holy envy. At see what I can learn from reading and studying, but unless some miraculous path opens up to me to explore that, to leave it alone. 
Now, Merton never got to the point, unfortunately, because of his early death, to really go any deeper than scratch the surface with he, these traditions. So he only really got to the colonial imperialist part of all of this, and he never really had a chance to study in great depth the particular traditions and practices of a particular indigenous group of people. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Salvestano. Um, we have time for, it looks like, two more questions here. Dr. Stark, I see your hand up. I'll read the question that comes from our chat first from Dr. Floyd, because it does relate to the question that you've been responding to, Peter, and it might actually have already been in some ways answered, but I want to allow you to be able to specifically address uh, Dr. Floyd's question. And then, Dr. Stark, you'll have the final, the final question for the night. Um, this comes from uh, Dr. Floyd. Thank you, Peter. I'm curious to hear more about interspiritual dialogue. How would you define spirituality as distinct from religious or perhaps confessional faith? Right. So um, this is really an anthropological question. And whenever I teach anthropology of religion, I kind of try to make two arguments. Uh, one is uh, all religion is the product of human consciousness. Um, students who are devoutly Christian often push back against that, and I have to remind them, whether the scriptures are revealed by the Holy Spirit or not, the reality is that Holy Spirit was filtered through the minds of a particular writer at a particular moment in history. There's nothing in the Gospels about refrigerators and computers because those inspired writers of the gospel knew nothing about those things. So outside of that, there is something fundamental about being human uh, uh, that is the source of all religion, I think, from an anthropological perspective. That capacity to wonder, uh, and I often say it in these terms, and I ask your forgiveness for my slightly dicey language, but, you know, religion comes from questions like, how the hell did I get here? What the hell am I doing here? And where the hell am I going when I leave here? And not only that, why do I have all of these experiences of illness, suffering, famine, war, love, beauty, all of those things, that is fundamental human spirituality. That fundamental human dimension that we all have then is taken and shaped and molded and constructed by particular religious traditions using the language of that tradition, the symbolism of that tradition. And what we know about ritual studies is that um, language and ritual literally shapes and molds the flesh of the body. This is not a metaphor. This is what brain science is about that we cover in my anthropology of consciousness class, that ideas actually and it's such it's such a Christian idea. It's incarnational, right? The idea that the word becomes flesh, literally, and not just in Jesus, in all of us. So, you know, that's what I could say in response about the difference between fundamental spirituality and then spirituality as, as it is taken and shaped and molded and constructed by a particular tradition. The interspiritual part comes in with our capacity to be able to change modes when we need to. And, and how to do that. And that still is an area that requires so much more research and development. There is so little out there about how to actually do that kind of practice. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. Um, I said, Dr. Stark, you would have the last question for the evening if you have this question for uh, Peter. Sure. Uh, Todd, I just want to make sure nobody else wants to make a point or Raise a raise a question. Sure. Yours okay? is the only hand I see up remaining. Okay, we've, I'm we've it. Gone through okay, all the, the, the chat. Go. Yeah. So it will not surprise most of you who know me that I'm going to bring this around to an ecological perspective, 
And I'm very glad, Peter, that you mentioned that both for Thomas Merton and for Dorothy Day, they were deeply, deeply critical of consumer society without fully playing out the destructive aspects of that for the entire planet. So I think there's a platform there to really bring that forward to some extent with Thomas Merton's work. The other, the other person I'm so glad you mentioned is Thomas Berry. And of course he was here at Seton Hall before he started the Riverdale Institute. And I do want to recommend to everyone, if people haven't read it, is the, is the book called The Journey of the Universe. And if you want to read A Journey of, the Trans of Transformation, this is the book for you, for the 13.9 billion years that the cosmos has been in existence. Written by two of Thomas Berry's very important uh, contributors to his work, and that's Mary Evelyn Tucker and Brian Swim. It's a very small book. It's probably only about 100 and something pages. I use it in my core class. And the emergence of consciousness is the absolute central dynamic in that journey of the universe. Yeah. And I'm so glad, too, of your emphasis on consciousness and especially the Buddhist understanding of this because that fits right into an environmental trajectory as we try to deal with the ecological crisis that we are in right now. And if there's anything about this pandemic that can end all the struggle for racial justice that can help us, it's the brokenness and the opening of all of us to this kind of transformation. It's not a question unless you want to comment on it, Peter, but I'm really glad you mentioned the emphasis on the critique of the uh, consumer society. Thanks, Peter. No, but I will say, uh, just to add on to what Judith said, just about a month ago, a new biography of Thomas Berry came out, written by Mary Evelyn Tucker okay. and also another fellow, John Grimm, oh, who yes. was also a big, uh, a central student of Thomas Berry, um, and it's fabulous. And in fact, in in this volume, uh, Don St. John has an essay, and he was also a student of Thomas Berry's. Yes. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Peter. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you, Peter, and thank you, everyone, for your My questions. Um, Peter, just obviously a wonderful presentation and wonderful time to be able to interact with you. Dr. Enright, I'll turn it back over to you. Well, I just want to thank you, Peter, and, uh, you know, just for your passion. And, uh, you know, uh, I, th I think I'm just really excited about this series. And, and, and you know, this was, this was just wonderful to see everybody here and hear your questions and just hear the depth in which you uh, delved into this. I, if I could just say one thing that came, comes to my mind, um, as you were talking about, uh, you know, the interest spirituality, I was thinking, you know, a lot of people, they'll talk about, you know, talk other, like, other religions and religions, almost like in a superficial way, or like that we, uh, it's almost like it doesn't really matter what religion you have because not, none of it really matters. You know, there's that's like sort of like where you pick and choose what you like because it all really doesn't matter in a sort of secular, um, almost like denunciation of religion. But when I was listening to you talk, I was picturing somebody diving into water. And the deeper that you go, the more you can connect mm -hmm. people who are in the water, you know, in a different place, but you know, it's from a place of depth that one can really connect with people from another faith in a meaningful way. And so I thank you for that insight and thank you for uh, sharing with us tonight. So I just want to say to everybody, please join us in two weeks. We will have another one of these wonderful talks. Um, those of you who are planning this, we, there are several of us who've been involved with this. Can somebody help me? Who's the next person? I, I don't have the list in front of me. Um, Inez may want to contribute con contribute to the. I think it's our Jeff Morrow presentation. Oh, Jeff Morrow, yes, yes. 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 Wait, yeah. Inez, yeah. do you just want to uh, say what that's going to be about, so we can do a little commercial? If, I hate to use that word in connection with Martin, but uh, you know, and let, <laughs> I'll, I'll say I won't say a commercial, but let people know the next thing. Inez, do you want to just uh, speak to that? Uh. 
Is she there? Maybe. Inez, are you on the on mute? Yes, I am. I am. I, I was on mute actually. So uh, the next speaker would be uh, Jeff Morrow. That I'm sure you know. Oh, Doctor Jack Jeff Morrow, or we'll go Professor Doctor <laughs> Jeff Morrow. <laughs> We're being okay. very formal. <laughs> yes, we have been extremely formal, but uh, yes, who is a professor of Catholic theology at the Immaculate Conception Seminary School of Theology. And uh, he, Jeff actually uh, is going to, to speak about his, uh, uh, his new book um, about uh, biblical exegesis and theology that have completely separated scholar, uh, scholarly activities, he said. So he's going to bridge uh, scholars. Uh, in his latest book, Liturgy, Sacrament, Mystagogy, and Martyrdom. So we are going to hear a lot about martyrdom uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, Jeff's uh, uh, book. So that's, uh, uh, yeah, that's... Uh, I forgot the time, Nancy, what time is that, but uh, it's a little different. Right yeah. then, then this the timing. Yeah. I'm, yeah. yeah. Oh, it is at two p.m. It is at two p.m. So yeah, October twenty seventh. Yeah. Yes, yeah. October the twenty seventh at two p.m. And uh, uh, I'll ask you know Todd because Todd, you are the MC per excellence now. So <laughs> go ahead, you know. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank, thank you very much, and as I and so put that on your calendar. That is the there's this, that's the only one that's on a Tuesday, and it's at two. So it you know don't get thrown off. We hope to see you then. And thanks again, Peter. It was wonderful. My pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Bye everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thanks, Peter. It's fantastic, yeah. buddy. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. And Peter, I'm sorry to be so quiet. I'm on reference, and I just no, knew as soon as right. I asked a question, that's I'd get a reference question. Don't worry, it's fine. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Bye, everybody. Peter, I have to wish you a happy St. George's feast day, though, before you leave. Oh, thank you, Maureen. <laughs> you and St. Gerard are like this in my world. Thank yes, you. Yes, there you go. St. Lucy's. In good company. Oh, yeah. Well, Peter came up to me once, Nancy, and gave me the most beautiful gold medal from Italy of St. Gerard. I didn't even know him. Oh. He, he noticed a little tiny medal I got from Monsignor Garada when I was a midwife. We had our hands blessed there. Oh, beautiful. And Peter came across the room. I could cry, Peter. <laughs> I could cry. You don't remember it, Peter, but I do. I do remember it. That was a long time ago. <laughs> it was 30 years ago. <laughs> and October 16th is right around the corner. It certainly is. That's right. And I thank you, Peter. Every year, you're in my heart. Uh, thesis thank you. Well, thank Beautiful. you, Maureen. My thank pleasure. You. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank, Bye. You. thank you. Thank you.